Welcome to the Funny Because It's True podcast. I'm your host, Kevin McGeehan. The show is recorded live every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are either predetermined or chosen randomly on the night of the show to tell a true story based on different themes, and this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is embarrassment, three stories of discomfort and chagrin. Laura Keller has her family history splashed across MSNBC. NASA scientist Josh Willis fails to convince a room full of people about the effects of global warming, and I look like a big old dummy in front of one of my celebrity crushes. But let's not dawdle. First up, Laura Keller. When Kevin first asked me to do this, I was like, oh, embarrassed. I'm like, this is something I do every day. I'm embarrassed constantly. Um, And then I was like, oh, but also I've like just socially conditioned myself to just not be embarrassed after I do something mortifying. So I was like, I have to find something that was like terribly high stakes to me. And I was like, I feel like there's so much stuff that I've like probably blocked out from my childhood. So that's what I'm going to do. I feel like high school's a totally embarrassing time for everyone, right? I mean, I I guess unless you were like super cool in high school. I'm going to kind of assume that no one in this room was because, hear me out here, I feel like people that are really popular in high school, like, don't end up growing up into adults that, like, are super into the comedy circuit Um, because we laugh to keep from crying, right, guys? So I wasn't cool in high school, but I also wasn't hated. You know, I was just like, I kind of walked that line of, like, total invisibility, um, kind of like that Emma Stone movie, Easy A, where she's like, oh, I walk down the halls and no one sees me. And then I was like, I call bullshit on that, Emma Stone, because anyone who looks like her in high school got attention. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Hollywood, right? So um, I was just, I was super awkward in high school. Obviously, I'm crazy tall now. I was this tall then. Uh, and I was really pale and like not in that like glamorous porcelain way. I was like clear like a jellyfish. (laughs) Like you could just see my organs. Um, But high school is embarrassing every day. It's like what? So you like fall down the stairs in front of a guy you like or like when you walk around all day and don't realize that that morning you sat in yogurt. Or like when someone in your family decides to murder someone. (laughs) Let me tell you from personal experience, that is tough to like socially come back from. (laughs) Um, I, my favorite part of this whole thing is how I found out about the incident. We're going to call it an incident. It was a straight up murder. It was a fucking murder. Um, but I went to high school in Philadelphia because I'm originally from Florida and, um, I feel like that's embarrassing enough. Like, I feel like I could close with that, like based on the topic of the evening, but from a very young age, I was like, I have to get the fuck out of Florida. So I went to high school in Philadelphia, which is equally as disgusting. Uh, and I got a call from my mother and we had the most normal conversation ever. She was like, can I send you anything? And I was like, money. And then she told me all these great friends, like uh, stories about her drunk friend, Susan, which I like never tire of hearing. And then she's like, oh, I've got to go outside and walk the dog. Uh, but before I forget to tell you, Grandpa Fred shot Rose. She's dead. Okay, bye. <laughs> so I'm sitting on my futon. Um, Rose was his wife, by the way. The fifth one. Uh, and I'm sitting on my futon, my roommate Elizabeth walks in, and I was trying to like think of a graceful way to describe Elizabeth without using adjectives like stupid, but um, I'll just give you a taste, like once I saw her grocery list, and there were so many blatant misspellings on it, but like my favorite was her interpretation of the word soap, which she spelled S-O-P-E. This was like... A 15-year-old, so like one-syllable words. We can't do it. Good job, America. Uh, So she's like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, I think my grandpa just murdered his wife. And he's like, can I borrow your DVD of How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days? And I was like, fine. So I just remember telling my friends in the dorm that night this story. And essentially what happened was it was a pretty heated divorce. And he had some money. He was a successful businessman. She was super young when she married him. 
which I feel like maybe the money was maybe a little push for her. So when they got divorced, she was going to get 50% of everything. And he didn't like that, so he murdered her. (laughs) As you do, right? Um, So I was telling my friends this story in the dorm, and they're being like, pretty supportive. I'm mortified, but also not the kind of person that can just hold it inside. I have to tell everyone. So they're looking at me like, I'm sorry, but also are you genetically wired to be a murderer? Like they're worried about living down the hall from me. And then fast forward a couple years, um, I'm living in New York, living the dream. Grandpa's chilling in prison. Uh, And I get a call from one of my very dear friends. And he says, Laura, uh, turn on Dateline. This guy has your last name and he's from Florida. Is this your family? (laughs) That was perfect. (laughs) And it was. So now not only like in Philadelphia and in Florida and in New York, I have like three cities of friends that know I have descended from a psycho killer. Uh, The moral of this is no matter how mortifying your high school experiences were, and they feel so terrible at the time, if MSNBC doesn't give a shit about it, like you're going to be fine. (laughs) Thank you guys. Before we get to our next storyteller, I need to put his story in context. NASA scientist Josh Willis is a frequent contributor and friend of the show. Before the show the other night, he asked me if he could take a risk and try something different with his story and tell it as a character. Curious to see what he would do, I promptly said yes, and that night he told his story as film noir scientist, aptly named Guy Scientist. Next up, Josh Willis. I'm going to tell you guys a secret. (laughs) It turns out there's a vast conspiracy to deceive the American public about global warming. I'm talking about the right-wing conspiracy to deny that climate change is caused by human activities. Who am I? I'm just a guy. A scientist, studying the climate and waging a quiet war against ignorance and denial. Oh yeah, and I also work for NASA. (laughs) It was a bright, clear Tuesday afternoon in a state known for its sunshine. The kind of Southern California day that makes you wish you called in sick and had a picnic on the beach. But this was no picnic. I was headed right into the belly of the beast, one of the most conservative places known to man, Orange County. The Newport Beach Country Club, to be exact. I'd been invited by a small group of good old boys to give a lecture on global warming. They were called the Sparrows or Blue Jay Club. It's not important. What is important is who they were. Old world power brokers, CEOs, oil barons, the kind of men who don't take no for an answer. But I was ready. I've given my global warming talk a thousand times to a thousand different school children and school teachers, even congressmen. I showed up early to check the place out and clock the old timers as they arrived. It was fancy, all right. Expensive carpets, hardwood tables covered in white linen and more oak on the walls than an East Texas forest. My suspicions were confirmed when they started to arrive. They were old, all right. You could almost set your watch by the sound of the pacemakers. And white, too. I've seen more diversity in a bowl of basmati rice. Matter of fact, Everybody in that place with a skin tone darker than Mitt Romney's teeth was wearing a tuxedo and handing out hors d'oeuvres. I could tell I was going to have my work cut out for me. But first, they fed me lunch. Prime rib. It was delicious. And then it was showtime. I started off with a few jokes to lighten the mood. But my punchlines landed like lead balloons on a Spanish tile floor. 
Then I showed some charts and graphs. I provided incontrovertible evidence that the climate was changing faster than any time in the last 10,000 years. I looked into the audience, but I could tell they were still skeptical. I've seen more trust in the eyes of a five-year-old boy on a subway holding a Power Ranger in his tiny white-knuckled hands. It was time for the big guns. Time for the balloon gag. The balloon gag was a simple physics experiment designed to illustrate the heat capacity of the oceans. Turns out the oceans absorb over 90% of the heat from global warming. Why? Because water can suck up heat faster than a desperate housewife downs mojitos on a hot summer day. I pulled out a balloon and filled it up to a nice healthy size. And I pulled out my trusty Zippo lighter and snapped open a flame. I held the flame to the balloon and it exploded like a firecracker on the Cinco de Mayo. Now I had their attention. I explained that the balloon filled with air had a very low heat capacity, but you fill a balloon with water, you can stand there with a flame against it all day and it won't get so much as a blister. I pulled out my water balloon. I held it high so everybody could see. This was it. This was the moment I won the hearts and minds of the skeptics with a simple demonstration of physics. I held the flame to the balloon. It exploded like a watermelon, hit with a 44 hand cannon from close range. Instantly, my hand was soaked and water rained down onto the carpet like a river of liquid shame. A small brown man in a white tuxedo appeared out of nowhere and laid a white linen napkin over the wet spot on the floor. That's when I knew I'd lost the crowd. They started to pepper me with questions about data irregularities and natural climate cycles. I gave them all the right answers, but I could tell I wasn't going to win any hearts and minds that day. You win this round, Sparrow Blue Jay Club, I thought to myself, but you haven't heard the last of me. I packed up my things and headed for the door. Well, at least the sun was still shining. Yep. Just another day in the life of Guy Scientist, Climate Crusader for Truth. And finally, me, Kevin McGeehan. You don't mess with Joyce Sloan. I used to work at Second City uh, in Chicago for a very long time, and I started at the very, very bottom. I started working in the box office. There was a woman there named Joyce Sloan, and Joyce Sloan was the matriarch of the building. She was uh, beloved by everyone who ever worked there. And if you were fortunate enough to be working there, she would take you under her wing. Uh, to put it simply, if you had anything good happen to you in your life, you made two phone calls, one for your mother and then one to Joyce. <laughs> I struck up a friendship with her, and I would go back to her office, and she and I would sit there for hours, and I would just ask her questions about Second City because I loved it so much. I was so eager, bright-eyed, and bushy-tailed, and she would answer every one of my questions. And she uh, had this office full of memorabilia, and she told me the story of Bill Murray going on a touring company to a women's college and then disappearing for three days and then showing up to the theater like nothing happened. <laughs> um, uh, she had a letter from Gilda Radner that was so very sweet and polite. Uh, I know the theater isn't making much money right now, but is there a way we could get softer toilet paper? Uh, and she still had that note. So she and I built up a nice friendship and a nice rapport, and um, I got cocky one day. So I'm sitting in the box office, and she walks in, and Joyce announces, Bonnie Hunt is coming to visit me today. Now, at this point, I was 27, and I loved Bonnie Hunt. Uh, I thought she was dreaming at that time, and uh, I was so excited, and I could not mask it, and I said, oh my God, Joyce, you've got to let me meet Bonnie Hunt. Joyce, being a little playful with me, said, no, she's come here to see me, not you. And she walks away, and then I have to go back to the box office. And I could not believe she said no. I mean, we sit in her office, and we have tea, and we watch Cubs games together, and she's saying no to Bonnie Hunt. That's unacceptable. So on a break, I walked back to her office, and I said, I think I know exactly what this is, I said with a bravado and a swagger. <laughs> You're nervous that if Bonnie Hunt comes here and she meets me, she's going to fall in love with me and not pay any attention to you. <laughs> to which she responded, yes, Kevin, that's exactly what I'm worried about. <laughs> about an hour later, I'm sitting in the box office, and Bonnie Hunt arrives with her writing partner. 
They come up the front stairs. Joyce gets to them first. I'm stuck on the phone, but Joyce sees them and starts to take them back to her office the back way, but looks at me, sticks out her tongue, and gives me like a nanny nanny boo boo face, <laughs> showing that she has now won this round. So they go back to her office, and I'm stuck in the box office, and I can't leave. On another break, I take the opportunity, and I run to the back office, and there's a bathroom back there, a private bathroom that you could use. So I start walking by Joyce's open door, like waiting for someone to catch my eye, and then Joyce does, and then I walk in, and I say it like I have a, a purpose for being there with, hey, Joyce, oh, hi, I'm Kevin. So then Bonnie Hunt shakes my hand and says, oh, hi, I'm Bonnie. And then I turn over to Joyce and give her a little devilish grin like, I did it. You can't stop me from meeting Bonnie Hunt. <laughs> Bonnie Hunt says, oh, what do you do here? And I said, well, I work in the box office. But at that point, I could proudly announce I just got hired as an understudy to the National Touring Company, which is the lowest rung you can be in the theater. <laughs> she says to me, well, don't worry if you never go any farther than that. A lot of successful people have never gotten past that point. And the room gets awkward. <laughs> and I'm standing there, and uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, she didn't give me any encouragement whatsoever. And um, all I can think to say is, going back to my bravado and swagger, and I said, Bonnie, I was very excited to meet you. You're one of my favorite alumni, but Joyce said I couldn't meet you, but I showed her, didn't I? <laughs> to which Joyce responds without missing a beat. He also said that you would fall in love with him. Did that happen? <laughs> Bonnie, well, I kind of like my husband, so no. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do except to gather my remaining dignity and walk out. I said, well, it was very nice to meet you, Bonnie. To which she responds, it was very nice to meet you too, Steve. <laughs> to which Joyce, once again, without missing a beat, yeah, we'll see you later, Steve. <laughs> you do not mess with Joyce Sloan. That's it. That's our show. Special thanks to our storytellers, Laura Keller and Josh Willis. Also thanks to Josh Callahan, Mark Warzeka, The Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. You can like Funny Cause It's True on Facebook to find out upcoming show dates and themes. All the past episodes are available for free download on the Comedy Podcast Network and iTunes. You know what? While on iTunes, feel free to leave a rating and a comment about the show. More comments help the show grow to a broader audience on iTunes, plus it appeases my staunch and never-ending desire for approval and acceptance. If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Because It's True is every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood, located on historic and sex-shop-laden Hollywood Boulevard. So come out, put your name in contention, and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage, and from there, get chosen to be on the podcast. My name is Kevin McGeehan. Thanks for listening. You have received this transmission from the Comedy Podcast Network. For more shows, visit ComedyPodcastNetwork.com.